Um, so we have to transition now um, to a difficult conversation, and I want to I want to intro this conversation by sharing that I, I need to speak a little bit today about the darkness that some of us are feeling in our bodies and in our spirits. I'm going to be speaking about a darkness that comes in lots of different forms, but sometimes in the form of depression and sometimes suicidality that can feel so big and so painful that we might feel like we can never escape it. And I'm just offering these words of introduction because I am very aware that we have people in our room today with us um, who have very fresh or age-old wounds of grief. And I am asking that we hold each other tenderly as we have this conversation. And for those who are watching over little ones this morning, um, I want you to know that I will choose my words carefully, as I do, um, but I want you to know the topic of conversation so you can be attentive to what your little people are taking in today. By chance or by grace, it happened that last week when I was launching my book on the East Coast that I was able to join Representative Jamie Raskin in an intimate conversation about the book, about love and loss and community and connection, and how we can begin to heal as individuals and as a nation. As you probably know, Representative Raskin has written and spoken publicly and courageously and extensively about the tragedy that befell his family when his beloved son, Tommy, with his, in his and Sarah's words, perfect heart, perfect soul, riotlessly outrageous and relentless sense of humor and dazzling, radiant mind, died by suicide just a week before the insurrection. In fact, Representative Raskin, as you may recall, got up from Shiva, from the House of Mourning, in order to show up in Congress on January 6th to vote to certify the election. He and his daughter, Tommy's sister, were in the chambers when the insurrectionists breached the sacred halls of that building, and they were whisked out of the room and into hiding as history unfolded before them and all the world. Personal grief compounded by national grief. Representative Raskin and I were speaking about my book and his, and the idea that we as relational beings are called to hold one another in the most difficult moments, just as we are called to meet one another in moments of great joy, and about the ways that we can and we must reach out to one another relentlessly to help pull one another back from the edge of the abyss. At some point in the conversation, Representative Raskin paused and cleared his throat and said the following, I think it's important that people understand that we can't always pull one another back from the edge. He teared up as he spoke, and so did I, because I know that he's right. I've learned this over the years as I've witnessed among friends and community members how a darkness can sometimes creep into the soul and how that darkness can sometimes become impenetrable and how even all the love in the world and all the will in the world can sometimes not save someone who is dwelling in that darkness. This is something that we have experienced as a community, and this is something we've spoken about as a community many times, but sadly the world reminds us that we must speak about it not once or twice or three times, but regularly, because some of us who are sitting in this room today are living in that darkness. And some of us are holding loved ones who are or who were. And I need you to know that you are not alone. That we harbor no fantasy of being able to pull every person from the depths, but we will do our best to meet one another there, to sit with one another in the pain until you are, God willing, one day ready to emerge. We've spoken many times here about the plague of darkness that we read about in Parshat Bo, this week's Torah portion. This mystifying penultimate plague that consumes the people of Egypt with a viciousness, a ferocity that is hard for us to fathom, unless, of course, you are a person 
who understands the darkness. Here's what the text says in chapter 10. Then God said to Moses, hold out your arm toward the sky, that there may be darkness upon the land of Egypt, a darkness that can be touched. Moses held out his arm toward the sky, and a thick darkness descended upon all the land of Egypt for three days. People could not see one another, and for three days, no one could move about at all. The rabbis pick up on the terminology that's used in these verses about the darkness that can be felt and can be touched. But the Hasidim, the Hasidic rabbis read it deeply and personally and urgently and incisively. And here's what they say. Listen to the words of Chidushe Harim. This is Yitzchak Meir Rotenberg Alter, the first Rebbe of the Ger Hasidic dynasty, writing in the 19th century in Poland. For three days, no one could get up from where he was. He writes, this is the deepest darkness when a person can't even see his neighbor and therefore cannot be with another person in their suffering or pain. When a person no longer feels the pain of his neighbor, he feels that he himself is impotent and therefore he sits idly by while others suffer. No one could get up from where he was, the text says. That means they cannot get up to help one another. In other words, it's not only when we can't be supported by others, but when our suffering is so great that we're unable to support each other, that's when our lives become stripped of meaning. Surely this is among the most devastating of plagues, the terror of total disconnection in this world. And all the while, the text points out that the Israelites enjoyed light in their dwellings. Chapter 11, verse 23. You know, like when the whole world seems to be okay and you are not. When the whole world seems to be walking in one direction and you in another. So why is the text calling us to peer into the depths, training us, it seems, to see what we might not otherwise see, that we might be totally okay, but our neighbor, our friend, our loved one, the person sitting right next to us or across from us in this room right now, might be completely not okay, or the other way around, that we might be in the deepest possible darkness of our lives while the whole world is just marching on. Why is our tradition calling us to confront this terrible, painful truth? I can only imagine that the Torah is insisting that we not shy away from the most painful and raw and real of human experiences, prying open our hearts to imagine and then prepare for the, po the hardest possible eventualities so that when they come, because they come, we will not run away from one another. And so we're called to confront the possibility in this world of a darkness so thick that one feels completely alone, even when surrounded by love. A darkness that, as Rabbi Nubachia describes, renders the passage of time utterly senseless, a darkness that makes no space for light at all, no stars, no moon, no escape, a darkness that reaches into every corner of the home and the being, an excruciating, impenetrable darkness in Rabbeinu Bachia's language, the darkness of an imprisoning black box locking us inside. Some of us have a passing acquaintance with this darkness and some of us know it intimately. Many of us are feeling paralyzed by this darkness right now, today. For some of us, we live with the darkness of depression. For others, we feel the darkness of grief and helplessness and hopelessness, especially these past few months, especially this past week, when we pass 100 days since this anguished war has started, when we confront the depths of the horrors of what's happened and what is still happening when we wonder how much more sorrow we could even hold in our fragile frames. And many of us encountered this darkness once again this past week, when we suffered a loss in our own community, the loss of a beautiful, vibrant, brilliant human being, someone who sat right here in these seats, who loved deeply and was loved deeply and wanted to live, but could not be pulled back from the darkness. Here's what I hear Representative Raskin say 
and what I've learned over the years of loving and losing people who dwelt in that darkness, that we must differentiate between different kinds of darknesses that we or our loved ones might confront. Because sometimes we encounter the darkness of the plague. That is a darkness that is so thick, it cannot be pierced with a knife, so heavy that the person living with it can neither rise up nor sit down. And even when surrounded by love may feel totally and completely alone. In Sforno's language, this is a kind of darkness that cannot interact with light at all. In that darkness, lo ra'u ish et achiv, a person could not even see another person. Even lighting a flare or a fire could not make a dent in that darkness. It is not a failure when we cannot reach people in that darkness, because in the plague of darkness, one cannot be reached. And when that plague strikes, all we can do is come together in our anguish, surrounding the brokenhearted in the embrace of love, holding memory and holding one another with no stigma, with no shame, with no blame, but just with tenderness. For even a lit up flare, even an entire fire could not make a dent in that darkness. I first learned this years ago from a colleague, Rabbi Jonathan Kligler, whom I've mentioned before in this place, whose raw honesty awakened me years ago to this truth. Listen to the words that he wrote in a breathtaking eulogy after the death of a wondrous 15-year-old girl, Maya, who died by suicide in his congregation. He bravely shared in that eulogy that years before, when the rabbi was himself 24 years old, his own father died the same way. And he looked up in this room and he addressed Maya's friends and family. And he shared that after many years naturally of feeling great anger toward his father, he was now left only with compassion. Maybe because he said, I have been alive long enough to appreciate how hard it is to be a good human being. It's time, he said, to break the cycle of shaming and harsh judgment when we learn of someone taking their own life and instead respond with compassion and try to understand the unbearable suffering that led them to their choice to die. Again, he writes, as I recall my own teenage bouts of despair, my young adult debacles and defeats, I too might have fallen into that pit. There, but for the grace of God, might I have gone. So do not judge. You are not in their shoes and will never know what they are experiencing. Instead, just open your hearts to those who are suffering, and if you can, catch them before they fall. As Representative Raskin shared, sometimes the darkness is the darkness that is so impenetrable that nothing can break through. He and his wife Sarah described that Tommy was tortured by a blindingly painful and merciless disease called depression, a kind of relentless torture in the brain. Despite very fine doctors and a loving family and friendship network of hundreds who adored him beyond words and whom he adored too, the pain ultimately became overwhelming and unyielding and unbearable, at least at last for our dear boy, this young man of surpassing promise to our broken world. I hear Representative Raskin's words, you cannot reach everyone. But here's what we must note. Not all darkness is the darkness of the plague. Not all darkness is impenetrable. There is also the darkness of night. And again, in Sforno's formulation, the darkness of light consists of air that is ready and capable to absorb light once the morning comes. Pay attention, our rabbis seem to be saying. Sometimes it feels like the darkness is impenetrable. It feels like the world is impossible. It feels like this is the darkness of the plague, but it actually is just the darkness of night. And with time, we will move through it, and new light might, in fact, emerge. This is a darkness that can be pierced by love. So we can't reach everyone, but we can reach some. Some can emerge from the darkness with the right combination of medication and support and community and care and love. The problem for us is that we can't always tell the difference between the darkness of the plague and the darkness of the night. So we have to try always as if we can break through. We have to reach out to those who are living in the darkness with relentless love. 
and with deep presence. Because even if there's just a little bit of air, a little bit of spaciousness in that darkness, we can make room to absorb the light in the morning. I will say this to all of you again and again and again. We must never stop trying to reach one another, to see one another. We must never stop turning to each other with unending love. We cannot make a dent in every darkness, even with the greatest light, but we can in some. We can and we must. Shabbat shalom.